Well, if you've got a Bible this morning uh, on your phone or a physical Bible, then if you turn to Exodus chapter 13, uh, you may not be you know, expecting that, but we're actually going to be in Exodus chapter 13. Um, and as you're turning there, let me confess something. I've been thinking lately a lot about life insurance. People ever think about life insurance? When it comes to life insurance, I find there's two questions. Question number one, have I got it? Question number two, have I got enough? Those are the kind of two questions when it comes to life insurance. And I find it's the same with faith. Often people have two questions about faith. Some people ask, have I got it? And other people ask, have I got enough faith? Well, this morning on this Easter Sunday, I want to try and answer that question, whether you have faith and whether you have enough faith. And to do it, I'm actually going to go through history, and we're going to stop in three times. So I'm going to be a little bit of a Doctor Who, a kind of sermon TARDIS. We're going to go all the way back to 1300 BC. Then we're going to zoom forward to 30 AD, and we're going to land back in 2024. That's the hope. So let's go all the way back. Let's go all the way back to uh, the Exodus, 1300 BC. And uh, we're going to be thinking about this. And every time I come to the Exodus, I always think of my favorite film of all time, probably the best film of all time, The Great Escape. Have you ever watched The Great Escape? It's the greatest Christmas film after Die Hard. You can debate that over lunch, whether those are Christmas films or not. But uh, Christmas films, uh, The Great Escape, if you don't know it, Steve McQueen, he has been put in prisoner, in a prisoner of war camp. And apart from playing basketball against the wall for hours on end, he wants to get out. Now, the thing about Steve McQueen and the other people in this prisoner of war camp is they need to get out twice. So they not only need to get out of the camp, they need to get out of the country. Do you remember the famous scene at the end? He's on his motorbike. And you see, and every Christmas I watch it and think, today he'll get over. Or his friend getting on the bus, and I think every year he won't answer in English. Anyway, uh, you can have to watch the film. I just love it. And when it comes to the Exodus, it's very similar. When the Israelites, if you remember, were slaves in Egypt, they needed to get out. But actually, they needed two getting outs as well. See, the first getting out was an objective one. That is, they needed to get out from under God's anger, which is why they were slaves to Pharaoh. But secondly, they needed to get out of actually loving being slaves to Pharaoh, actually worshipping Egyptian gods. Now, on um, that first kind of exodus in the Old Testament, two things happened. The first one is what we call the Passover, which is the night they fled, which is the night. And that is the first part of the rescue. We're going to think about that in a moment. But then there's a second part, which is the parting of the Red Sea. They needed both to get out. So let's catch up, have a look. Exodus chapter 13. If you've got a church Bible, it's on page 70. And let me read for you uh, Exodus chapter 13 and verses 17 to 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though there was one which was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Very interesting, isn't it? So know where we are now. They've just had the Passover. They've just been freed. But God says, I think they might be tempted to go back. Seems strange, doesn't it? Have you ever come across something called Stockholm Syndrome? Stockholm Syndrome is when someone actually is kidnapped or they're taken hostage and they end up actually defending the people who've taken them hostage. They care for them. It's a strange thing, Stockholm Syndrome. So here they are, and it says this, carries on. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. And he, he had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left his place in front of the people. God is with them. God is leading them, and the glory of God is leading them. Can you imagine? A pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Now, there is an objective truth here. They have been saved. 
God has brought them out of slavery. They've beaten Pharaoh, and they are going, and God is leading them. They have been freed from slavery. But the problem is they don't feel they're free. That's what we're going to see. They're struggling. Their hearts are still back. Even though they have objectively been freed, in their mind, in their heart, they're not sure. And actually, there's something happening out of sight. So turn with me to chapter 14, and let me read um, uh, Exodus chapter 14 to fill you in on what happens next, verses 1 to 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and camp near Pai Hahiroth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to camp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will, Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their service. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt um, with, offi with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that they pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pihahiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Then Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, without, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Now then. I'm sure you know the story from school, from Sunday school, or even from uh, the films. But they've come out, they've been saved, but even though they've been saved, they're in a desperate situation. The problem is they've, they've come out, and what we've got, and this is what these are here for today, they're in effect, where did God tell them to camp, did you notice? On the edge of the sea. It's not a great military move. So all the, Egypt, all the Israelites are on the edge of the sea, and the Egyptians have now realized what's happened, and they go charging after them. So when the Egyptians are charging after them, and the Israelites can see them coming, they look behind, and behind them is a wall of sea. There is nothing they can do. I wonder whether they had some committee meetings, maybe some focus groups, maybe some blue light sky thinking, maybe they had little groups doing a sprint or whatever you do in your workplace, and they thought, right, what are we gonna do? And maybe one committee said, we can build a bridge. We'll get Griffiths in. They know what they're doing. We'll build a bridge. They'll do it on time. It'll be fine. We can just do it. And people would have gone, no, no, they're coming over the brow of the hill. There's no chance of building a bridge. They could have looked at every which way to save themselves, but ultimately, their backs are to the water. The Egyptians are coming. There's nothing they can do. So they cry out to God. But you notice, 
when they cry out to God, what's going on? They know they've been saved from Israel, uh, from Egypt, but now they're not sure whether they should have just stayed. And they're not sure if Egypt are going to come and win the day anyway. It's interesting, isn't it? They've been saved, but they're not really sure if they've been saved. I don't know if you're a Christian this morning and you can understand that feeling. You know something's happened, but now you're looking at a situation, this wall of water, you're looking at everything coming and you're going, maybe I haven't. Maybe it would have been better just for us to stay. And so God does something amazing, doesn't he? He says, okay, look at the water, see what's going to happen, and he performs some people to help me thank you who's where's charlotte and ah oh, come down i've got some stage hands here to make sure that we can do this properly because what happened to the wall of water thank you very much we're going to see what happens to the wall of water there's nothing they can do and then god does a miracle and the wall of water is moved and before you know it there is thank you very much i'll let you go down they'll be back up in a little bit they move the wall of water this way that they thought there was no way is now a way. God makes a way. You know, when I was in school, we were taught about this, and it was the Red Sea. And I remember my teacher saying, but don't get too excited. He said, because the Red Sea is the sea of reeds. So actually, it was only like two foot deep. And, and so actually, when it talks about the Israelites going through, don't be like that amazed. To which I responded, wow, God drowned all those Egyptians in two foot of water. <laughs> I mean, either way, it's a miracle, isn't it? Either way. But here is God doing an amazing thing. And so throughout the night, they just walk through. That's what they do. God has saved them, and God is saving them. It's interesting, isn't it? God knew they were going to struggle to believe that they'd been saved. Maybe they thought, maybe we just got away with it. Maybe it was just a coincidence. Maybe it was just a phase. And then they're put in a situation where they really have to trust God in the Passover. And God does this huge miracle, and out they go. They go through. It's amazing. Now, the amazing thing about the Exodus is, is that in the Old Testament, it kind of works as the testimony of all the Old Testament believers. All the Old Testament believers say this, we were slaves in Egypt. But God rescued us by a Passover lamb who died in our place. And then, when our backs were to it, he parted the Red Sea. And we had the great exodus. And we went out to freedom. And now we are a new people. But it wasn't just something that looked back in the Old Testament. Actually, it was something that looked forward. It was a prophetic movement to the greater exodus. Actually, he was teaching us that one day there was going to be something very similar. There was going to be a Passover lamb, but there was also going to be something else that needed a greater miracle. Let me explain. Let's jump forward. Okay, we, let's get back in our TARDIS. Let's go to 30 AD. Let's go to the first Easter. And what we see in the first Easter is God's saving act in two parts. Just like Steve McQueen in The Great Escape, just like the Israelites coming out of Egypt... For us, on that first Easter, it was a saving, redemptive act in two parts. It was, on Good Friday, the death of Jesus, our Passover lamb. So, like the Israelites in Egypt, we were slaves. We were stuck. But actually, Jesus comes and dies in our place, takes away the punishment we deserve, and takes away the slave master of sin and death and Satan, and gives us freedom but the problem is many of us we feel stuck can we put that back is that all right if we move that back for us because i think the problem is there's lots of things in life where we feel our backs are to the wall um, it might not be the red sea but it'll be different things so some of us you see we trust in jesus or we're thinking about trusting in jesus and well the simple thing of death is it really going to work on my deathbed or maybe there's problems and struggles and suffering. And we feel sometimes like there's nowhere to go. And sometimes even Christians can go, maybe it would have been better not to be a Christian. Maybe it would have been better not to trust in Jesus. 
Is this really going to happen? Or perhaps you're here this morning and you're not a Christian yet, and you're wondering, is my life now worth giving up for Jesus? Is it really worth it? Is it a better life? Or is it just better to stay where I am? Often it's when we come to this wall of water. It's when we come to this challenge that we are really made to think about it. And so for us on Easter weekend, Good Friday reminds us of the Passover, the Lamb. But Easter Sunday reminds us of what? I'm going to ask you up one last time now. I feel really bad for Aaron and Charlotte. They're going to come up and they're going to move it uh, once more. Look at them and then we will give them a clap. They've gone somewhere. Where have they gone? They're up there. This is your last time. Well done. Thank you very much. I said we'd do it twice. This is the second time now. Well done. Look at that. They came to church to relax. <laughs> you see, and on Easter Sunday, when the, when the stone was rolled away from the tomb, from the entrance of the cave, what did it teach us? It teaches us that actually the ultimate wall behind us, the wall of death, that is gone. That actually now we can go through from death to life. And Easter Sunday is the ultimate proof that Good Friday was real, that it worked. Just like for the Egyptians going out, it was going to the Red Sea and the Red Sea parting was the ultimate proof that they'd beaten Pharaoh and that they had freedom. For us, that's what Easter Friday is. He has done everything. Because do you remember on the Good Friday readings when you read over Easter weekend? Do you remember when the disciples saw the cross? How did they respond? Do you remember how they responded after the cross? They cried. They wept and they ran away. It's really interesting, isn't it? But then on Easter Sunday, when the tomb was empty and they saw that Jesus had risen from the dead and the women came running proclaiming the gospel, well, that changed everything because they were a people of the risen King. He hasn't just died, he has died and risen again. He hasn't just died in vain, he's died in victory which means we now can all rise again. It's amazing, isn't it? On that Easter Saturday in between, the disciples thought it was over. The authorities thought they'd dealt with the problem. Satan thought he had beaten Jesus. But Easter Sunday says, no, something very different happened on the cross. I love the way Paul describes it in Colossians. In Colossians, Paul says this in chapter two, Jesus forgave us all our sins, Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us, he's taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The only way we know the cross was victorious is the empty tomb. Friends, have you trusted in Jesus, knowing that he has died for you and risen from the dead for you? That actually, if you trust in Christ, there is no wall of death or fear that you will ever face that can now stop you or beat you. But actually, in Christ, you have complete victory. That you will live with him and live forever. The point of the resurrection is it shows that Jesus has paid for our sins. For the Old Testament, it was a Passover and parting. For us, it was the cross and the resurrection. In a sense, what God wants us to have is... The objective truth that we have been freed, Jesus has died for us and risen from the dead, but as well the subjective experience, the heart experience of knowing that Jesus has died and he has risen from the dead. And so too will I. So let's get back in our TARDIS. We're getting there. Let's come all the way to 2024. What does this mean for us this morning? Well, I want to ask you uh, three questions as we come to a close. Three very simple but profound questions. Here's my first question. Are you trying to build a bridge? Do you remember we spoke about the Israelites against the wall, had commit committee meetings, thinking, how will we get over this? For some of us this morning, we know this stuff that we face, and we know that the ultimate enemy is death. And some of us are trying to build bridges See, the thing is, the Egyptians could see, the Israelites could see the Egyptians coming. They knew they had no time. We fool ourselves and think we have all the time in the world. I'll be okay. I'll live a good life. I'll do good things. 
I'm just going to work this out. I'll build a bridge. I'll be okay. Friends, the Bible says don't try and build a bridge. There's no need, and you can't do it. There's no way you can build a bridge through death. But Jesus has come and died for us. I guess the question I'm asking is this. Have you got life insurance? Do you know that when you die, you're going to be with Jesus? But then I want to ask a question to a second group of people. Because I think sometimes Christians come, and Christians can be worried about the quality of their faith. That is, have I got enough life insurance? You know you're saved, but you're getting to some kind of wall. It could be even a wall of your own sin and shame. And you're wondering, have I got enough faith? Have I got, let's put it this way, enough life insurance? See, that's my problem with life insurance. Is it yours as well? Let me not worry you. But I think, will they pay out in the end? Or will there have been a form I didn't quite fill out or something I didn't quite declare? And then it's void. Do you ever wonder that? On that last day when you face Jesus, will you go, I think you'll find you didn't quite do the right thing. And I think some of the, the struggle is sometimes wondering, did we have enough faith? Let's go back in the TARDIS. Come all the way back to the Old Testament with me, okay? There were hundreds, thousands of Israelites coming out of Egypt. They'd seen the seas parting, and then they had to walk through. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I think this room will divide if I ask a question. Okay, so let's see if I'm right. I want you to imagine you're in the TARDIS, you go back... You're there, you can see the Egyptian armies coming over the, the mountain, and then you see God do this amazing miracle, and so the water parts, and these massive mountains of sea go up on either side. Here's my question. How many of you, hands up, would go into that mud, singing and dancing, going, hallelujah, this is going to be great? How many of you? A few of you. Come on, be honest. A few of you would. How many of you are going to tiptoe through looking at either side, thinking it's going to come crashing down at any point. Brilliant. Amen for your honesty. Which of the two groups were saved? Both. Both. Friends, Easter reminds us that your salvation is not about the quality of your faith. It's not about how hard you believe. It's about the object of your faith. It's about the one you believe in. I praise God that people got through even though they struggled. God saved them. And so if you give your heart to Jesus, you might not believe completely. You might struggle. Do you know when I became a Christian, I was 15 years old. I was in a scrapyard. My dad was welding underneath the car. And he said, hold this bucket of water just in case it catches fire. I look back and I think that's not great parenting. But anyway, I was sitting in the back of the car. My dad was welding underneath the car. And I'd been thinking about Christian things for months and months and months. And, and in effect, my back was to the wall. I was only 15. Um, but things in life and in family were really, really tough. And then I was coming to the point, I was thinking, but is it true? Is it true? I'd read books. I'd thought about it. I'd spoken to Christians. And I still couldn't decide. And so I can still remember my prayer to this day. This is how my great prayer of faith came out. God... If you're there, I want to give my life to you. It's hardly the great prayer of faith, is it? But there was faith. I don't know. It's like a mustard seed. It was the smallest grain of faith. But you see, my faith was in a great God who had given his only son. And because I did that, God took that little faith. You see... It's not my faith that saves me. It's the one I put my faith in. So it's not about the quality of your faith. So maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, but I haven't got 100% stellar, brilliant quality faith. That's okay. If you believe that Jesus has come and lived and died for you and risen from the dead, do you know what? If you come to him and say, I want to give my life to you and live for you, he will accept you there and then. And even Christian, if you're here this morning and you're struggling because you still think that 
the waters are going to come crashing down. I'm going to get stuck in the mud and there's no way forward. No, no, you're okay. Because the walls of water are not looking to your faith. It's a gift of God. And if you have trusted in him, he will keep you. Friends, the question, have I got enough life insurance when it comes to heaven, is an irrelevant question. If you've trusted in him, you are his. I love the way Sinclair Ferguson puts it. He says this, faith is by definition non-contributory. It is the reception of Christ, not an addition to his finished work. It's because Jesus has died and risen again. It's brilliant, isn't it? Friends, we need to see this. So, are you building a bridge? If you are, you don't need to build a bridge. Jesus has come for you. And if you've trusted in Christ but you're struggling, he will keep you. He will never let you go. You can trust in him. And so here's my third and final question. Are you living free? You see, Exodus doesn't finish when they get through the parting of the Red Sea. Then he wants them to go and to live. To live for him. You see, that's the problem with life insurance, isn't it? You don't get to enjoy it. <laughs> You've got to die to enjoy it. And that's my fear with the Christian gospel, is it sounds like we're saying, you know, life is great, but best trust in Jesus, so at least when you die, you've got him. It's like a life insurance policy. No, it's not, actually. It's a really rubbish illustration. Let me just apologize. It's not life insurance. It's life. And it's life now. By becoming a Christian, you don't have to wait until you die to enjoy God. Actually, he transforms your life now. The problem is sometimes we think slavery is better than life. It's not. The freedom that Jesus gives us is life-changing. You can enjoy it now, and it's all for his glory. So, friends, have you trusted in Jesus? Have you walked through the waters? And if you have, are you trusting in him and enjoying the life that he's given you? That is the ultimate message of Easter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that the tomb is empty, that Jesus has risen from the dead, and so that we know that when Jesus said, it is finished, paid in full, it really was. Father, we thank you that you have given Jesus that we may enjoy life now and forevermore. Father, would you help us to trust in you and to know that you always hold us, that you always lead us, and you will never leave us. And we pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.